Good morning, Edmison Heights Baptist Church. This is Sunday, May the 2nd. Let's join together in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for the amazing love that you pour on us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love for us, your sacrifice, as we share around the table of communion today for the privilege of being able to meet with you, of being one with you and one with each other. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have come, that the Father has sent you at Jesus' request, and that we have your presence, your help and strength for us at all times. Father, we need your help and your encouragement as we continue in this pandemic, as we uh, find ourselves in difficult situations because of isolation and illness and in many other areas as well. We pray today, Father, for Jill Plumley and for your help and strength for her. As she battles cancer and undergoes chemo treatments, we pray for your touch of healing, for your resurrection strength flowing in her body and that cancer to be removed from her. We pray for Gary and your strength and encouragement for him and your help for them as they stand together and for your help for each of us to be an encouragement and support to them. Father, we thank you for your care for Pastor Chris and ask for your continued help and healing for him. We pray for your care for Ruth Brown and her family and your strength and encouragement in their lives as well. Thank you, Father, that today people are gathered worshiping you while it's online. They are still in your presence, delighting in you. We pray for your care and protection for every congregation within our city and region. We pray for your blessing, too, on the many ministries that you've brought to Peterborough that make such a difference in the lives of people. And we ask for your care today for Mike Sweeney and your blessing on a fellowship of Christian farmers. You know, in this past year, that there was no opportunity for them to be able to share, but we pray that in the coming months that you would open doors so that they can share the good news and the life of Jesus with people all around them. We ask for your presence with us as we consider your word and as we, again, share around the table of communion in a little while. Holy Spirit, come and draw all attention to the Father and Son, even as you open God's word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover... Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous signs can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the weeks, as we've been considering the question of who is Jesus, today we're going to look at the question of who is Jesus, and the answer is the temple. We see a number of things about Jesus in this account of the cleansing of the temple. There are two different instances of the cleansing of the temple in Scripture. In John chapter 2, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and in the other three Gospels, at the end of Jesus' ministry. 
John places the temple cleansing where he does because he is revealing the very glory of Jesus to people. He wants them to understand who God is and the glory of God that's about to be fully revealed in the life of Jesus. So we see a number of things that Jesus does and about him in this passage. The first thing is that Jesus removes the barriers that keep people from approaching God. The temple was to be a place of worship, prayer, instruction, and sacrifice. But at Jesus' time, on this particular day when he came to the temple, seekers were being prevented from finding God. They were being prevented by the very people who were supposed to be God's representatives, God's Jewish leaders, his teachers of the scriptures. They were to be there to help people find God, especially people from other nations who were Gentiles, who were seekers. But instead of being representatives of God, they turned that place into a place to make a financial profit. We read that there was a coin exchange that was going on. In the temple, they took the coins that were <clears throat> approved for temple worship, and people who came to give financial offerings had to make an exchange of currency. There was a fee that was charged for that exchange of currency. People who came to offer sacrifices, animals, uh, most of them came from a distance and couldn't bring the animals all that way with them, so they bought the animals that had been approved by the religious leaders, and again, there was a fee and sometimes a markup on the value of the animal. And John particularly mentions about those who sold doves. The whole point of mentioning them was that doves were the offering of the poor, people who couldn't afford normal offerings, who had next to nothing. Again, there was a fee. Even from the poorest of the poor, there was a profit to be made. Jesus was removing those barriers, those places of commerce that were preventing people from approaching God. All of this took place in the court of the Gentiles. It was the place that was open for everyone. It was a place for seekers to come to find God, and no matter who you were, you were allowed into that precinct. Women were allowed into the next court, the court of the women, and then men were allowed into the further court that was closer to the most holy place in the temple. We read secondly about Jesus that later on the disciples remembered that zeal for his father's house would consume him. This is a quote from Psalm 69 verse 9 where it says, for zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The disciples remembered later on, Scripture had prophesied that this would be one of the characteristics of Jesus, of the Messiah who was about to come. The passage for us is kind of disturbing, because it's the only place where we see Jesus acting out uh, an anger towards those who are preventing others from coming to his Father. Jesus' anger was righteous anger. It wasn't mixed in with selfish motives. This was about protecting people, caring for them, and so he was removing those who were preventing that. He kicks out the vendors and he says, How dare you turn my Father's house into a market, a place of profit? In the cleansing that took place a second time later on at the end of the Gospels. In Mark chapter 11, he says, as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The third thing we see about Jesus in this passage is that Jesus has authority. He has authority, which is why he cleanses the temple. It's interesting to note that the religious leaders ask for a miracle to prove that Jesus had that authority. We need to take note that they didn't tell him he couldn't do this. And I think it's because they knew that what they were doing was wrong. They had figured out a way to make a profit for themselves 
which prevented people from actually approaching God and finding him. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. So they asked for a miracle, and Jesus gives them a miracle. But the miracle he's talking about is his resurrection. He gives them their request for a miracle, but not in their timing. They want it right now. So he answers their question. He answers their request for a miracle. But as is so often the case, Jesus is working on God's timetable, not on people's timetable. He gives them the most important answer possible, but they don't understand it because they're looking for something demonstrative that takes place right now, right in front of them. The temple was such an important thing in the life of all the Jewish people. The order to build the temple that they were standing in front of at the time of Jesus was actually issued by Herod the Great in the year 20 BC. Herod the Great was not a popular king, and he wanted to buy the favor of the Jewish people by building them a temple that was even more spectacular even more magnificent than the one that Solomon had built for them originally. When Jesus is meeting with those religious leaders, their declaration is from whenever work actually started on the temple to that point, it had taken 46 years. And in fact, when Jesus was there with them, the work on that temple was still in process. The temple wasn't completed until 64 A.D., it was a period of 84 years from when Herod first gave the instructions to when the temple was completed. And while Herod died long before it was ever completed, it was the very center of Jewish life. It was the center of worship, the center of political power, the center of economic prosperity for the city of Jerusalem, the center of nationalism and pride. And Jesus, Jesus was actively, intentionally taking on those areas of power. He was taking on the structures on which their Jewish culture had been built, not by God, but by they themselves. He was a taking on the form of worship, the political power, the economic prosperity, the nationalism that was there. So we read that Jesus upset tables, but he also upset people. He did it then, and I have a feeling that if Jesus was amongst us now, if he came to our worship services on a Sunday, if he looked at the way we are influenced by our culture and allow our culture to participate and to direct everything we do, the structures that we use for life, I think he would have some things to point out to us that we need to correct. He would upset us now, just like he upset them then. Jesus had authority. We need to ask the question in, in, as our fourth point. What is, it, what is it that makes the temple, well, the temple? Why is it the temple? The answer is, it's the temple because of the presence of God. It was a physical place where people could come. It was a, a meeting of heaven and earth, an intermediary place where God allowed his presence to reside and allowed people to come and meet with him. There was, as you know, the temple veil that separated the holiness of God from a sinful people. And it was where that borderland where holiness and sinfulness could meet. The thing that made the temple the temple was not the building. It was the very presence of Jesus himself. And now Jesus makes it clear that he, in fact, is the temple. So when Jesus answers the religious leaders their question about what miracle will you show us to show us you have the authority to do this, his answer is, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They don't believe him at all. 46 years to get to where they were and still much more to be done. And Jesus says he can raise it in three days. But John explains to us, Jesus wasn't talking about that building. He was talking about his body. 
which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' body was the temple of the Holy Spirit because, while well, he was himself a human being and God at the same time, the Holy Spirit had come on him and filled him. And he was the presence of the Holy God that was to be in the Holy of Holies. What makes the temple a temple? It is the presence of God. And by God's grace, since Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension to the Father and the sending of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, and from then on, the Holy Spirit has been living in each one of us. In a few weeks' time, we'll be observing Pentecost together, celebrating that day of the coming of the Spirit, but celebrating it because it wasn't something that just happened in the past. It's something that continues to this very moment. So we read in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Paul says again later in that letter in chapter 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What makes the temple the temple? The answer is the presence of God. And Jesus was telling those people, if you tear down this building, my body, it will be raised again in three days. The place of worship, the place of meeting with God where a sinful world can come to a holy God and sin can be dealt with. He was and is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But now he's given his spirit to us and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Individually, yes, but even more significantly, collectively. Edmison Heights Baptist Church, each one of us who love Jesus and are filled with his spirit, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Every congregation, every small group, every church, small church, house church within Peterborough and the Kawarthas, collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Since we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, there's some things that we need to remember. The fifth thing about Jesus is that the zeal of God for God's house consumed him. And so our fifth thing for us is that zeal for us consumes him as well. Just as Jesus was concerned about those who were coming to God to be able to worship, to pray, to sacrifice, to learn, to meet God in person and have living relationship with him, Jesus was consumed with the fact that he wanted people to come to God and be set free. That's the whole reason he came. That's the reason for his full sacrifice. Any barriers that were there that would prevent people from meeting God, he was focused. Jesus wanted to remove those barriers. So the zeal he had for his temple that we see about in John chapter 2 is also the seal for us that consumes him. Since we are his temple, there are responsibilities for us. We are to keep it clean. That is, we are to be people who are holy and live in intimacy with our God and walk with him moment by moment. And we are to see to it that since it is the presence of God that makes the temple the temple, we are to see to it that we are filled continually with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. These first two points, since we are his temple, keep it clean, and see to it that it is filled with the Holy Spirit, these are really concepts that are described in a practice called spiritual breathing. I think in a few weeks we will spend a whole lot more time looking at this concept in depth, but it's important for us, spiritual breathing. We breathe in fresh air, we exhale air that is impure. Our bodies are designed to do that. Our walk with God is also designed to do that. 
when we're aware of things that separate us from God or from each other. Certainly when we sin, we confess it and repent of it. But even in terms of our attitudes, in terms of things that, are, that come to mind where there is a resentment or an envy, where there is a, a competition between us and people that isn't right, we confess these things. Father, I did that. Father, I know what is wrong. I turn from it and I ask for your forgiveness. That is exhaling. Get the things that poison, the things that separate out of our systems and hand them to God and receive his forgiveness. But do much more than simply confess and receive his forgiveness. See to it that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So inhale, ask, Holy Spirit, I know you live in me, but I give you my heart and my life, my time, all I am and have. Fill me with your presence. Breathe your breath into me. Cause the flame of your presence to burn brightly and, and fully so that the glory of Jesus is seen. Exhale, confess. Inhale, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and to renew you and strengthen you. Even though he lives in you all the time, this is a relationship. It's an ongoing thing and there is renewing and strengthening in it. Spiritual breathing, keep it clean, confess. Breathe in, receive the Holy Spirit and invite him to take direction in your life. I know it was a breakthrough for me in my own walk with God when I first came across this concept. Often we have, well, the experience, we do something wrong and we know we did it, but we go on with our lives. If we have a regular daily practice of meeting with God, of prayer, of devotion in his presence, then we kind of wait until that time to stop and confess. But in the meantime, we've walked through a day where where we're grumpy, where we're out of relationship with people, where there's a chain reaction. We take this false step and every other step that takes place after it seems to be affected by it. But we don't need to let that chain reaction take place. We can actually stop right on the spot and say, God, I just had that thought, or I just said that unkind word. Forgive me. And if I just said that unkind word, I'm going to go and talk to the person I said it to and, and ask for forgiveness and, and simply state I was wrong to say that. And Holy Spirit, fill me because I know your intention for me is to walk with you in every moment of every day. Spiritual breathing. Since we are his temple, keep it clean. See to it that it is filled with the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, make it a house of prayer. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer for all people. Prayer is God's gift to us. Access to the one who is, who is our life and our direction. Access to the one who can help us in every situation that we face. He doesn't intend that we deal with our situations in lives, either to choose our vocation or to live and do the tasks that are meant to be done in the day on our own. He intends that we do it with him. And so we get to come to him and talk to him and ask for his help. Times of intimacy and prayer with him, and then a day of intimacy and prayer and ongoing conversation, fellowship and walking with him. Make it a house of prayer because he wants to hear from us. He wants to speak to us. He wants us to live in a two-way relationship with himself where we tell him our needs and he speaks his love to us and gives us direction of how to live. And lastly, help the seekers to see God. Remove any barriers of selfishness of our own agenda or of sin that would prevent people from seeing who God is. On that day, in John chapter 2, when Jesus came to the temple, he saw people who were coming to seek God. And the people who were God's representatives were preventing them from seeing God while they were busy making a profit. It's the same for us today. People get to see God through us. They get to see God by the kind of lives we live, by our words, by our explanation of our love for God. They get to see God in our interactions with each other, 
how we help and care for and serve each other and, and how we help and care for and serve our community. We are the gospel to people all around us. And they need to be able to find God when God's Holy Spirit stirs in them to wonder about who God is, to wonder where there's life. The pandemic is an especially important case in point. Many are searching. People are frustrated, afraid. They want to know, is there a God out there who knows and cares and sees and helps? And they see that God through you and me, us, his followers. So any barrier that prevents that, any lack of wanting to share the life we have in Jesus that prevents that needs to be removed. And not just to remove the barriers, but for us to be engaged in our community. We talked last week about Jesus being the life of the party. And that's what our God wants us to do. He wants us to bring life wherever we are, to bring healing to broken relationships, to bring laughter and joy and celebration, for us to delight in people. Even if they're far from God and their lifestyle is destructive, he still wants us to delight in them, and they know when we do. Not to bring our judgment, because we don't judge them, but to bring the freedom that we found in Jesus, which we have received so freely. Zeal for us consumes him. And since we are his temple, keep it clean. See to it that it's filled with the Holy Spirit. Make it a house of prayer and let seekers see the God we love. Now that really brings us to communion. It really brings us to the table of our Lord in which we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. The same requirements of being God's temple are the requirements for sharing at this table of communion. Repent, confess, forgive, be reconciled. The Lord is zealous for you. He loves you. And so let us now transition. If you would get bread and juice, have it together and in your homes, your families, if you're with other people, then gather together as we Remember Jesus' sacrifice, but as we also join together recognizing that we are the temple, the very body of Jesus, we belong to him, but we also belong to each other. This table is a table of remembrance of what Jesus has done for us and a table of recommitment, not only to our God, but to each other because we are family, daughters and sons in Christ of the Father, made one through Jesus. We died, and our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. So in preparation for this table of communion, let's pray. Our Father, we come to you now. We ask for the help of your Holy Spirit, first of all, to help us so that we will confess to you areas where we are separate from God separate from you, separate also from each other because of tensions or misunderstandings or conflict. Our Father, we bring those to you. In these moments of silence, by your Holy Spirit, show us the things that we need to confess. Give us hearts that are soft and responsive to you. Hear our prayers. So come lead us now as we pray privately and silently. Father, thank you that you've heard our prayers. Thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as Jesus told his disciples that those who, need a who have had a bath only need to have their feet washed. So we've received the bath through our life in Jesus. Our sin is paid for in full. But we do need to have our feet washed for anything that we have in place that has separated us from you and we thank you for that for anything that has separated us from the people that we are proclaiming we are one with them as we share around this table and we thank you for that forgiveness as well 
Help us even through this day as we go to people to make things right that we need to. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you have not ignored our sin, but you have paid for our sin in full. So we pray all glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you now for your amazing grace and gift to us as we remember your sacrifice. It is in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. The night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and asked the blessing of God the Father on it and broke it to symbolize the breaking of his body. He gave the bread to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat it together. Then Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, as often, Apostle Paul said, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us drink it together. Oh, our Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that your love is so great. Thank you that only by your goodness and grace, the sacrifice of your life, do we have life. We know that we can never repay what you have done for us. But we can walk with you and love you and be like you. And we enter your forgiveness for us even as we extend forgiveness to others. Maybe they don't deserve it, just as we do not deserve it. But while we've been given the greatest gift, we extend the greatest gift. To embrace your love for us and to welcome others into it. Thank you for your care. Thank you for this table of communion. Thank you for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for joining today. Thank you that we are the body of Christ together and that we get to celebrate one another as well as our Lord Jesus Christ. So I leave you with this blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.